Hello, welcome to another Renegade Economist talk show. Uh, today I'm joined by Dave Trott. Dave is chairman of Gate London. He went to art school in New York on a Rockefeller scholarship and then went on to have an illustrious advertising career, working on many of the adverts and campaigns that we would all know. Uh, the agency that he founded was Gold, Greenless and Trot, and that was voted uh, Agency of the Year by Campaign Magazine and the most creative agency in the world by Ad Age in New York. He was given the D and AD President's Award for a lifetime's achievement in advertising and has since written this book, which is Predatory Thinking, uh, and the tagline is A Masterclass in Outthinking the Competition. Dave, thank you. That was a long introduction, <laughs> but we're there. Uh, thank you very much for joining us. Thanks for your time. Um, let me start by um, opening this book and, and just reading this to you because I really because it, it, this this chimed me. Okay, um, we spend all our time in the world instead. Of, uh, sorry, we spend all our time interpreting the world instead of just listening. And I'm as guilty as anyone as that. I failed at everything at school, so I grew up convinced I wasn't very smart. Finally, at art school, I discovered advertising, and I knew it must be easy because I was good at it and I was thick. If I could do it, everyone else must be able to. So when I became a creative director, I developed a short fuse with people who wouldn't do what I wanted them to do. So <clears throat> there's this school career that you went through and you thought, well, I'm not much copper at all yeah, of this. Yeah. And then suddenly you, you, you bump into the advertising world yeah. and you go through that transition. Can yeah. you just start by talking to us about that time? Yeah, well, what, what kind of happened to me was I did most of my schooling in England, right up to A-levels and then foundation art school. And everything that didn't make sense to me, I'd stop and I'd question it, and I wouldn't accept it or move on until it did make sense. So consequently, I pretty much failed at everything because that's not how school works. School works, you learn it, and you parrot it back. And so I was a massive failure, and um, my sister uh, helped me get a scholarship to um, art school in New York, and uh, everything I had got in trouble for here was exactly what they wanted there which is question everything, break it apart, and don't accept it until it makes sense. Being a, a rebel and a reject over here hadn't worked. Funnily enough, going to America, which is a country founded by rebels and rejects, it worked brilliantly. And everything I got into trouble for here was exactly what they wanted there. And so when I came back, I began teaching people back here the way I had learned there, because suddenly I could see through the education system we had, which was like a conveyor belt. And, uh, I decided I didn't want to be like that anymore and there were probably a lot of people around like me who didn't want to be like that. And if I could find them, I could show them there was an alternative. And funnily enough, when I came back, um, the college, colleges were then paying me to go back and lecture. Uh, and the first seven of those were seven of the colleges that had turned me down as a student. And so what you clearly see is that we've got a lot higher standards for students than we have for lecturers. The irony burns, right? Mm. Um, and then when you started when working in advertising, back in this country, not um, yeah. across the pond, um, did you then see that people, people coming into that world had just accepted an awful lot that had been given to them and been spitting it out? And do you see that now? Or do you see that there is that question everything approach? Um, no, no, there certainly isn't that question everything approach. Uh, the <clears throat> What there is, is everybody, everybody wants not to be rejected so everybody wants to be part of whatever you do to get accepted so everybody does what everybody else does so everything looks like everything else and in advertising terms what that means is all advertising is wallpaper and only those who question it and want to be different and want to be different to everybody else and have the nerve to be willing to be different to everybody else will stand out I'll give you for instance they reckon we see a thousand advertising messages a day between laptops cross tracks Newspapers, TV, right? Yeah, a thousand advertising messages a day. Name one that you remember from yesterday. Well, almost impossible. Ten seconds. Well, yeah, I mean, I could, I could, I could 15, pull one out. On, eh? um, Twenty seconds. I saw one for a rubbish hotel chain, which was on the tube. So after half a minute prompted, what was the rubbish hotel chain? So after half a minute prompted, what you can remember from a thousand advertising messages just 24 hours ago is a rubbish hotel chain that you don't even know the name of. That's the scale of the problem. That's what advertising in this country, probably in most countries, actually is about. Now the reason is, you couldn't remember a thousand if you wanted to, there's too much of it. It's a, it's, it, and also, not only that, 
There's the newspapers to read, TVs to be watched, films to be seen, radio to Massive be listened to. Massive complexity. You couldn't remember all of that yeah. either. So all that you remember is the salient points from everything that get into your consciousness. Now what we should be doing, whatever media we work in, is separating ourselves off from that mass. Mm. So all of the conventional wisdom that everybody else spouts to desperately try and be part of that mass is pretty much guaranteed to fail. And unless you've got the willingness, the confidence to understand that and to be different to that, like Steve Jobs in computers, like Brian Clough in football, like Muhammad Ali in boxing. Well, let's talk about Andy Warhol because you mention him in the book and you can't ever accuse him of being wallpaper. Because when he went in your book, you write it when he says, You're deeply superficial, Mr. Warhol. Mm. Uh, uh, Warhol? Warhol. Warhol. Yeah. Uh, Warhol. That, was, that was almost Warthog, which would have been even more about uh, yeah. you know, He says, Yeah, I am deeply superficial. Yeah. What, what Warhol learned was exactly that. You don't look for approval, you do the exact opposite. 90% of the people out there aren't going to approve, and as long as you try to get their approval, the best you're going to happen is they won't, 90% of the people won't disapprove of you. So nobody will love you, nobody will dislike you, you'll be part of the mass. What Warhol understood was 90% of the people, you don't care if they disapprove of you. In fact, if 90% of the people hate you, that probably means you're doing something right and 10% of the people will probably love you. That's where Warhol was. The Tory party is, is the exception to that rule. <laughs> well, I don't know, if you look at Thatcher, say, not the current, the current Tory party is just wet. But if you look at Thatcher, better than half the country loved her. Yes. If you look at Churchill, better than half the country loved him for a long while and then half the country hated him. But at least you're in that pe where, period where... Now, who gives a damn? Who can even bother be going, being bothered going to the polls to choose between Clegg, Cameron or Miliband, three wet little dopey public schoolboys? Who can even be bothered? But what I would say is that the current uh, advertising meme, and you'd know better than me, but just looking at it, and also um, the corporate meme, mm. is that everyone's terrified to uh, do anything different. Mm. To the point where I naively used to go and, and sell to people and say to them, especially in the financial sector, you'll be first to market with this and then never go for it. Mm. And then they'd say, well, but who else is doing it? Sure, and sure, I'd say sure. everyone's doing it. Sure. And then, you know, lemming-like, they'd pile in. Sure. Why have we lost that uh, that that? I don't know, even if it's courage, why have we lost that appetite not to stand out? Well, in, in advertising terms, it's, uh, it's it, in, 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 I talk about advertising because I know about that. Um, it used to be, when, when advertising in this country first started to be good, which was about the 60s, 70s, 80s, you were actually trying to make ads that people talked about, that people, that little kids, school kids would talk about they'd repeat your line, they'd, they'd want your character, they'd wear your badge, they'd sing your song. So we'd get it off the screens into the streets. That was our media, free media. Yeah. And famously, Akron to Stanley, right? I don't know that one, but I've heard other people mention it. The, the, but, but you'd say... Well, you had a couple, you had a fair few. In fact. <clears throat> oh yeah, but at the moment, recently, you just heard Cameron make a speech in which he was t referring to someone and he said he does exactly what it says on the can. You've got, a, you've got an advertising slogan for Ron Seal quoted by the Prime Minister in front of four or five million viewers. That's all free. You're not paying for that. You know? So why you would do that, you would, you would try to provoke that free media. What's currently happened is the whole world in advertising is now all about awards. The punter has been left out of the loop. The loop is now to win awards. And punters don't give you awards. Who gives you awards is other people at other agencies. So they all give you, so now all advertising is done to win awards. So no wonder it doesn't make any sense to punters. It only has to make sense to other people at other agencies. Is it a, is it a broader theme? Is it a broader theme that um, basically they are industries talking to themselves? Yeah. Because oh, what oh, we're yeah. seeing yeah. is a silo mentality across, across commerce, really. Well, I certainly know that's true in, um, but it always was kind of true in politics. We, um, when um, I worked on the Labour Party, when Callaghan was uh, standing against Thatcher, and we'd written the PPB, a party political broadcast, and I went down to number 10 and gave it in, and I just, what was wrong with party political broadcasts is no one understands them and no one, they're all <laughs> boring as hell. Yeah, yeah. So I actually took party political broadcasts and wrote it all in human language for human beings to understand. Very simply, here's what we've done. Here's what's good about it, here's what, in human language. I took it in, they took it away from me, gave it to the think tank and turned it back into political language, yes. which talked to other politicians about what we said at the conference and so and so, and what they said at their conference in so and so. 
Guarantee him within 20 seconds anyone will be turning Turn the off. channel. Yeah. It's what politicians do. They're only talking to other politicians now. Advertising people are only talking to other advertising people, yeah. How do you start to break out of that? Because, you know, it, it is a malaise across the board, isn't it? Mm. And, and so how do you, where, where would you, how would you go about, if I gave you that brief to say, look, what we need to do is start talking, we need to start reconnecting with uh, punters. Where do you start and where do you hunt for that talent? Because surely not everyone. I mean, I don't know. <coughs> well, where do you hunt for the talent? I think that's a, that's a big point for me because part of what screwed up my industry is university graduates. Mm. Or there's been a massive influx into advertising. As soon as it became trendy, around about the 90s, there was a massive influx. Every university graduate, then whatever they'd studied at university, history, politics, philosophy, they suddenly wanted to do advertising. So all of these people who've been trained in nothing but writing essays about something dead people had done suddenly came into advertising and turned advertising into writing essays and thinking and theory and, again, nothing to do with punters. When advertising was great was when the kids came into the... straight off the streets, left school at 16 and came into the post room. And then these chances and, and, uh, came into the post room and they start to watch, how do you get, what's good in here? How do you get on in here? What do you do? How do we outthink these guys? How do we outthink, how do we get that job? How do we, and you've got guys who naturally think in a predatory way, natural street smarts, that then advertising was about that, about the transaction that goes on with consumers, which is if I want to beat all the other ads, I need the consumers to pay attention to my ads. So my ads need to be funnier. They need to be better. They need to be more what the consumers are going to want to pick up and repeat in their language. And the transaction then is I'll get their attention by being funnier, better, something they want to pick up. That transaction doesn't exist anymore because the consumers aren't part of the transaction. Now the transaction is how do I win awards? What I do is what won awards last year? Million pound production budget with a lot of CGI. And so the consumers are left out of the loop watching stuff like Be More Dog. You know the ads that are running at the moment, Be More Dog? Do you know what that means? Do you know who it's for? You know the ads? I do, yeah. Do you know what it means? Be more dog? No. Do you know who it's for? I do. You know who it's for because someone told you? Or? Yeah, someone. Well, I know who you it's know for. You a friend. Who well, a friend know. worked on it, yeah. yeah. But, so I know who it's for. Okay. But do you know what it means? Even though you know what it's for, do you know what it means? No, I think it's well executed, but I don't know, I don't know what it means. If your friend hadn't done it, I know the guys who did it too. If your friend hadn't done it, you wouldn't know who did it, and you also wouldn't like it, you'd be honest about it, and you'd think, like everybody else, it's for dog food. Be more dogs for dog food. It's not, it's not hard rocket science, is it? But no, we have to sit down and work this out. Be more dog. Be more dog means uh, live a life that's freer. Live a life that's more fun. Be more carefree. Be more carefree by having a mobile phone. A mobile phone will make you more carefree. In fact, the mobile phone, the brand, as we've all read at university, allegiance to brand, is all anybody wants nowadays. And if, we run an, if our brand runs an ad that you like, you'll buy our brand. So you run out and buy that phone brand. Now, excuse me, that isn't how it works. I can like your bit of film, but I can still go and buy something else. There's nothing in there that persuades me why I should buy your mobile phone brand. I can want to be more, be more dog and buy a different mobile phone. This is university bullshit. Current theme of, the current theme everyone coming out of university believes, which is if we make you love our brand, you'll buy our brand. Not true, I like The Guardian, it's a great brand. I'd never buy The Guardian, it's a really boring paper. Yeah. I read The Sun, don't like The Sun's brand at all, but it makes me laugh, and I put the headlines and make me laugh in the paper. It, it, it's process over product now. Yes. It's, it's the end justifies, it's the means justifies the end, yes. instead of the end justifies the means. It's exactly the opposite of predatory thinking, it's exactly the opposite of street smarts. This is write a thesis that'll get you to pass the exam. And that's why advertising now is all theoretical, and not practical at all. I want to talk about one other thing, um, which is that whenever I've bumped into creatives, uh, you see, I've got a bit of a, a problem. I'd like to hear your view on this. I've heard the word, I'm a creative a lot recently. Yeah. And I have a view, and I think I share it with the guys I work with, that business and creativity are not, that they're, they're linked, right? Do you, do you know De Bono at all? Edward De Bono? Yeah. Okay, so what you know from De Bono is that creativity is an adjective, not a noun. Right. De Bono says there are many people calling themselves creative who are actually mere stylists. Right. That's what the ones you've been talking to. You know, 90% of the creative department is shit, but then 90% of everything is shit. Then 90% of the creative department isn't creative at all. Right. But then 90% of the planning department, the, mar the, the, the marketing department. You can be a really creative planner 
You can be a really creative copywriter or art director. Creativity is a quality in how you do your job. Muhammad Ali was a really creative boxer. Steve Jobs was a really creative technician. Brian Clough was a really creative football manager. Those guys, I mean, really creative thinkers isn't to do with the job you do, it's to do with the outstanding, innovative, unusual, surprising quality you bring to the job you do. Whether you're a painter, you're not automatically, you're a crap painter, you're not automatically creative just because you're a painter. There are superb businessmen, really creative businessmen. You know, creative is a quality you bring to the job, not the job, my opinion. So, do you see that, because a lot of these people you Brans Branson's a really creative businessman. I agree. I Alan agree. Sugar isn't. I agree with that. I agree. Hmm? But so would you say, so because what I'm getting at is that there's also, amongst creatives, in inverted commas, a fashionable ignorance towards business or the core, core, core workings of business. That's because they're stylists. There's a, there's, a, there's a fashionable ignorance towards thinking, towards strategic thinking, because they're stylists. What they do is turn on the laptop, see what's new on YouTube, and do that. Yeah. Whatever the latest technique is on YouTube. And your view on getting out of this is what? Because I mean, because you're painting a pretty bleak picture of advertising at the moment. Well, and, and I agree with you in many respects. But how? Because we can't. It can't all be crap. There must be. There no, must be yeah. ways. There must be ways okay. that people are coming into this business where we can spot that talent well, and say actually. Two different ways. You got. You got. Yeah. It depends which end, which end you start off from. The advertising end. Or the consumers end. If right. you're on broadcast, and or this if is you're the telescope. Receipt. This is the telescope idea in your book. Yep, yep. So, Be More Dog didn't start off with what the consumers want out of mobile phones. Right, right. Now I'll give you something that did start off that way. Something I absolutely love and wish I'd done is the British Heart Foundation advertising with Vinnie Jones in. When someone's on the floor having a heart attack, you're supposed to revive them at 85 beats per minute. How do you do 85 beats per minute? Do you get your stopwatch off? No, they didn't do that. They found a song that goes at 85 beats per minute called Staying Alive. Ah, 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 staying alive. And they've got Vinnie Jones doing that to someone, and he says, so all you do is when they're over, you do this to them, 85 beats, perfect. And now they've done the follow-up with about 15 or 20 different people who've had their lives saved by, by people the Bee Gees. rush up by the Bee Gees song. Because you, your start point was what the punters need to know. They need to know what 85 beats per minute is. How can we put that in their language? And that's what, and what you're saying is the telescope idea is it that you go to you stand in the punter's shoes and think where from here. But what's happening at the moment is totally the opposite. Yeah, where does this have to work? It's like if if, if you watched football. Yeah. <coughs> Glenn Hoddle, when he was England manager, he acted <laughs> like <laughs> that, that golden era. He acted like planners act. Yeah. It was all theory. Yeah. It was all the middle of the park. Yeah. Great running, great strategy, great off the board. Nobody scored. Ferguson. Well, now if you start with the actual game is to be the last person off the park with more goals than the other bloke, yeah. you've got Ferguson practices for the end game. Yeah, what, the 2-1, so he practices at 2-1 as one of his yeah. training methods. Right? So what you've got is you've got the 99 World Cup where in the dying seconds, Schmeichel comes to the end of the pitch and totally unsettles the other, goal, the, the other defenders and they score. And then in the remaining seconds after that, they score again. And with a minute to go, you went from 1-0 down to 2-1 up. All by understanding, the job here isn't to play pretty football, the job is to get the ball in the net more than they get the ball in the net. How can we outthink them on that? Does your common sense sometimes give creatives, and in inverted commas, a bit of an ice cream headache? If you're not creative, if you're a stylist, it's going to be a problem, because you're not used to thinking that way. Because it's, of the what, rigour of the thought. Well, well, that's it, why this is quite robust month. with it, aren't you? Yeah, it's De Bono, it's Edward De Bono. It's not me, I'm not the bloke who invented this. You're, you're just passing the message on, right? This is street smarts. Right. This is creativity, predatory thinking, and I know street smarts, and I know for creativity. Mm. I learnt it in East London growing up, I learnt it in New York, yeah. on the streets there. It's, you grow up having to outthink people who are better than you, bigger than you, tougher than you, faster than you, smarter than you, Every possible way, they're better than you. Now, how can I beat them? That's the really interesting bit, the exciting bit. is isn't how can I beat people who I am better than, it's how can I beat people who are better than me. If the competition's got £80 million budget and I've only got an £8 million budget, how can I make my £8 million so work that's the heart. Here? That's entrepreneurship, 101. Well, that's it right there. 100%. But we've lost it because we've got the professionalisation of the middle class, all these people coming 100%. out. 100%. You see, you see Branson, he says, um, 
Do you know, can, sorry, can yeah, I just no, say one thing on yeah. this? Because you know the most interesting thing about Branson, yeah. uh, about WikiLeaks, remember all the WikiLeaks? Uh -huh. A lot of it was boring, it was batshit, frankly. Yeah. Um, but Branson said one thing confidentially to a Chinese um, conference. Yeah. He said, do you know the problem with British entrepreneurs? They've all been educated out of their intuition. Yep, yep, yep. Do you know, do you know um, Akio Morita, the yeah. guy who founded Sony? Yeah, I do. Yeah. I don't, yeah, but I don't. He said, he said the biggest assistance he'd had in growing his company was the total failure of nerve on the part of Western businessmen to move without research. Now, uh, I was talking to a guy, um, the guy who founded, we got an entrepreneur of it. Entrepreneur's not always pretty, by the way. It's about doing what works. There's a guy I was talking to who founded Eshore, Direct Line, Sheila's Wheels, Go Compare, all of these companies, one after the other, he's founded, um, Peter Wood. And he told me his motto is do it, then fix it. Which well, is exactly the opposite of British businessmen. He says you don't know what's going to happen until you've done it. But that was the Bloomberg approach, wasn't it? Stick the first one out and then get wisdom of the crowd to tell you where the glitches are. And by the time they're on version 7 and it's working, Microsoft only just launched version well, 1. It's what, Brand, it's what Branson said. is he'll, he'll have loads of little ideas will come up to him. And what he does is do them all. Because you never can tell which one's going to work. You've got to be prepared to have a lot of them fail, cut them off while they're small. But guaranteed, the one that works will work bigger than all the rest. Yeah. And the return on that will be much greater. And the important thing is you could have never spotted which one it was. If you tried to guess which one out of the five that was, you no. couldn't have spotted it. And you can only rationalise it in hindsight and make it look as though sure. you, you knew all the time. Sure, sure, sure. Has politics become a big thing in advertising, entrepreneurship, corporate business, from when you started to now? What, with politics with a small P? P, yeah. Uh, no, I don't, I don't. Or is it the same? I don't think it's any different. The only, the only thing that's changed is now with a, with a massive influx of university graduates who want to measure everything and write data about everything and rationalise everything. And, measure, and, and, you know, so consequently everything's slowed down to the pace at which there's no intuition anymore, anything can be argued, everything's like doing a thesis. And uh, because, every, and because everybody's frightened of getting fired uh, when they're young, you don't do anything wrong. Now the really interesting, exciting people you'll find are the people that get fired because they've done something wrong. And they'll get another job and they'll get fired there probably. And around about the third or fourth job, they're not getting fired and they're starting to be exciting and they're starting to be in charge and they're starting to be entrepreneurial. And you'll usually find that people at the top have got lots of stories about when they got fired. So what are the three things, the tripod of, of, of predatory thinking, if you were to Well, the first thing, of course, is question everything. Yeah. That's, you know, without that, nothing. Question everything. And um, the, something my dad taught me, my, which, which is very important to me, which was uh, the spirit of the law, not the letter of the law. So you find out why you're doing what you're doing, and you do it rather than just knee-jerk, obeying exactly what, you're do, what the words say without knowing why you're doing it, which is how most people do things nowadays, the letter of the law, not the spirit of the law. If you do the spirit of the law, not the letter of the law, it enables you to question everything you're doing and come up with a better solution. And certainly in my business, the most important thing that everybody ignores is context. And this is the third thing, context. Uh, context is, is uh, in any choice situation, someone's gonna choose the better option. I can't be better unless I know what I'm being better than. Most people, don't try to be better, they just try to be good. And they, they, so consequently it fails because there's no context. Do you know, is, is that cup big or not? Well, uh, compared to my thumb, yes. Uh, compared to a building, no. So the answer is always compared to what? So if I'm trying to talk, if, if I want to, someone to buy whatever I'm trying to sell them, the, answer, the question is always compared to what? I'm going to finish with this because I love it uh, with all my heart, right? This is it. Um, it talks about your wife and you say in here, um, as I said in an early story, my wife is Chinese and her religion is Taoism. In Taoism, clairvoyance is an accepted and quite normal thing, but I'm from East London. Talk to me. So, because so, you went to see this clairvoyant, right? And, yeah. and, and the, we, what, what I'm getting at is the cynicism versus scepticism. Because, ah. because a lot of people could watch this and think, God, he's a cynic. Yeah. Oh, nothing's right for him. Yeah. Oh, look at him. No, absolutely, as you say, the difference between cynicism so, and scepticism. Talk to and 
uh, scepticism is I, I don't believe it until you prove it right. and cynicism is I don't believe it even if you prove it now all knowledge all British philosophy has always been sceptical you have to question everything from 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 Hume through Locke and certainly if it well stop, go back further go to Descartes go back further than that go back to Ockham you just yeah, all, you can go, go, back, than go that. back to Socrates. You, you go to Plato, sure. can't you? Sure, Socrates and Plato. And then you can go, you can actually... Cynicism starts with questioning everything. You, you pull it, and, and if it doesn't tear, it's good. And if it tears, it's not good. Now, that's that scepticism, sorry. Now, the problem with cynicism is cynicism doesn't believe it, even if it... Well, cynicism is a very miserable way to be, because... That's, that's another belief system. Skepticism is the opposite of a belief system. Skepticism is, let's find out. Cynicism is a belief system, which is, I don't, it doesn't work. Whatever you do, it doesn't work. And partway why me going along to a clairvoyant, the cynical side of my head is saying, this is a load of rubbish. Why are you going to this? This is a load of knackers. But the skeptical side of my head is saying, hey, find, what have you got to lose? Find out. Two hours in an evening, the worst that you'll do is you'll lose two hours and you'll come out knowing more than you went in. And that's the worst that will happen. And you, so the cynic, what, what, what in, in, in my period, baby boomers, it's, it's not far short of Steve Jobs around the same time. We grew up in that period where you were fascinated with Eastern religion, Eastern philosophy. Who specifically? Well, it wouldn't be a specific one. It'd certainly be Buddhism, right. but it'd also be Taoism. So it'd be Lao Tzu, uh, Buddha, um, a lot of the, the Zen guys, Basho and different ones, but you'd see Steve Jobs would have two, uh, all he'd have in his bedroom was two photographs, was Einstein and Buddha. And that's pretty much, you put those two things together, you pretty much get Steve Jobs. And what you, one of the most valuable things you learn from Eastern philosophy is about mind. And you learn that the most valuable thing you can, you can realise is that you are not your mind. Yes. Whatever the tape is telling you, that's not you. That's the tape telling you that. That's mind telling you that. You don't have to listen. Yes. It's like, if, it's like the end of um, 2001, how the computer taking over the system and killing all the human beings because the, the, the job is more important than the human beings. So how is like mind. And if you, and if you listen to mind, you will sacrifice your whole life to mind, to conventional thinking, to not wanting to look stupid, and to worrying about other people's opinions. And when you look, when you when you look at, especially Buddha, uh, and what Buddha said is, don't do, don't believe, don't believe anything. Don't believe anything. Don't believe what the sages have told you. Don't believe what your parents have told you. Don't believe even what I have told you. Work it out for yourself, and when you find it to be true, give yourself give yourself to it with your whole being. That's absolutely what scepticism is. Don't believe anything. If you're not your mind, mm. what are you? Well, you don't have to be anything. You don't, you, that, that's not important. Defining yourself isn't important. Uh, knowing what you're not is important. But so if you can observe your mind in that chatter and the internal clatter that goes on, yeah. that's enough. Because you're, because you're distanced from it. You see, the problem with, with, with defining what you are is in order to defining it, define it, you'll have to step outside it. Mm. Now, how can you step outside what you are? You can't. You, you, it's, you're inside it. Therefore, it's going to be really difficult to define it. Anyway, why do you need to define it anyway? All you need to know is you're not that. The, you're, you're in this prison. I say prison. It's, you're in this room with a bear. And if you leave it alone, then the bear wins. That's the mind. If you can just separate yourself and realise you are not the bear, you now have free will. You can listen to the bear, and the bear can tell you all what the bear... And the mind is really, really useful. The mind will keep you alive. The mind will stop you walking out into the traffic. Yeah, the no mind is a great servant, but a lousy master. Yes. Yeah? That's... Now, bring that to what we do, whatever we do, and it allows you to question everything, and then see the, the, the crazy knee-jerk, unquestioning way most things are done and why most things don't work. No? It's been advertising, it's been paternal relationships, it's been, <laughs> uh, we've had a bit of Buddhism. We went to Plato at one point, Accrington Stanley, yeah, of course, yeah, the yeah, highlight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
and uh, ended with the future of America. Dave, uh, thank you so much for your time. Oh, great, thank you. And, um, and we've really enjoyed it. All these guys have absolutely loved it. And this is the book, Predatory Thinking, um, and the tagline, a masterclass, as you heard in Outthinking the Competition. Sorry about the noise uh, next door. Ironically, they're getting ready for marketing awards tonight. That's it from the Renegade Economist. Bye. Right. So how come you two guys got married then? Are you, are you married before this or after this? <laughs> you wouldn't get married after this, mate, I tell you that. <laughs> During it, at the start of it. Because I used to work with my first wife and that didn't work out at all. So Thanks, Dave. My second wife. <laughs> <laughs> I work with my wife as well. Just, yeah, the first half of the year was quite different. But now I was strong for it. Yeah, that which doesn't destroy me, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah.